here. So t today we're going to be in Matthew 25 and Deuteronomy 15. So if you want to mark those out, follow along you can. Matthew 25 and Deuteronomy 15. So today, I have a short little message that I've titled, Truth Money. And we've heard Pastor talk about the bankers and a lot of stuff that goes on in politics with the flow of money and how money plays a role in our everyday lives. So today we're going to dive a little bit deeper into that and take a look at what the Lord may be doing for us in today's world. So, let's start off with Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 31. I'm just going to read them because the Word of God is better than anything that I can say. So we're going to take it straight from the Word. Here we go. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two and another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two talents gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug a hole in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things, and I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you had to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said unto him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. Amen? Amen. Okay. So I want to focus there on verse 27. Thou oughtest, and this is not the King James Version here, but I took the King James Version. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money into the exchanges, or to the bankers. And at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. I think it's really interesting that we see the Lord saying that you should have put my money with bankers when he went into the temple and flipped over all the money exchangers' hands. There's a little bit of a dichotomy here, isn't there? On one hand, it's you could, you could have been responsible. Why did you bury this in the field? On the other hand, he's flipping tables because of what they were doing, making his house not a house of prayer. So we need to be careful and draw a line between these two things. But the main focus there is that you could have received interest if you just put it in the bank. That's responsible, stored, responsible stewardship. So what did we learn? Stewardship is important, what God blesses us with. And number two, that it's okay to invest responsibly to increase those talents. Those other guys who had the five talents and the two talents, what did they do? They went and traded. That means they used their mind. They thought about opportunities, and they took advantage of those opportunities in humbleness and in prayer. And when the Lord returned, he said, well done, my good and faithful servants. Now, let's move into Deuteronomy. So Deuteronomy 15, 1 through 11. The word reads, At the end of every seven years you shall grant a release of debts, and this is the form of the release. Every creditor who has lent anything to his neighbor shall release it. He shall not require it of his neighbor or his brother, because it is called 
the Lord's release. Of a foreigner you may require it, but you shall give up your claim to what is owed by your brother. Except when there may be no poor among you, for the Lord will give greatly and bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess as an inheritance. Only if you carefully obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe with care all these commandments which I command you today. For the Lord your God will bless you just as he promised you. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. You shall reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over you. If there is among you a poor man of your brethren with any of the gates in your land which the Lord your God has given you, you shall not harden your heart nor shut your hand from your poor brother, but you shall open your hand wide to him and willingly lend him sufficient for his need, whatever he needs. Beware, lest there be a wicked thought in your heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of release, is at hand, and your eye be evil against your poor brother, and you give him nothing, and he cry out to the Lord against you, and it becomes sin among you. You shall surely give to him, and your heart should not be grieved when you give to him. Because for this thing the Lord your God will bless you in all your works, in all of what you put forward through your hand. For the poor will never cease from the land, therefore I command you, saying, You shall open your hand wide to your brother, to your poor and your needy in your land. Alright. So the focus here is on lending and borrowing. And in verse 6, it says, For the Lord thy God blesseth thee. And as he promised thee, and thou shalt lend unto many nations. Now, we've heard Pastor talk about this before, haven't we? Are, are we lending today, or are we borrowing today? The USA is the biggest borrower in the world. Now, are we reigning over many nations? We're seeing that disappear, aren't we? Why? Because we're the borrower and not the lender. This is how the Lord works. And this is the system that the powers that be, the spirit of Antichrist, whether these people know or they don't know, they are being controlled and serving the spirit of Antichrist, who's bringing about the new world order, the one world government, setting the stage for the Antichrist. And we've seen this cyclically, haven't we? A lot of people back in World War II were looking at Hitler and seeing him even killing the Jews and saying, whoa, this is set up perfectly. This is, this is the Antichrist. See, the spirit of Antichrist is always and consistently trying to bring about that world, trying to bring about the fulfillment of the revelation of Jesus Christ. But it's only on God's timeline that this will happen. The devil has no power here. He has no authority here. Only with the blessing of the Lord saying, now it's time. Will the Antichrist ever rise and come to be? Important concepts to, to remember there. Okay, so what did we learn from the, from the stewardships of the, of the talents and from Deuteronomy? That we want to be a saver, not a borrower, right? It's good to save so that we can lend to others, so that we can extend that helping hand to our brothers and to our sisters. Now, this is where it gets a little tricky because now I want to take what we learn in the, in the Word and I want to apply it to what we have going on here today. How does it work with banks today? Because we take our hard-earned time and energy and we trade it for what they call currency or Federal Reserve notes, right? And then we take these notes and we think about it as like savings, right? You take your, your money, you put it in the bank. The bank is supposed to like protect your money for when you need it so that you can spend it whenever you need it. But that's not how the system works. That's not what the law says. Isn't it important what the contract says? Isn't it important to understand the fine print? Absolutely it is. Well, in the fine print, what we'll find out is that your savings in the bank is actually not savings. You are legally lending your money to the bank. Now, isn't that interesting? Isn't it interesting that the Lord tells us we should have went to the bankers so that we could get interest? It's better to do that with the talent than it is to bury it in the field, right? But then on the other hand, he says, be a good steward. Don't be a bad lender. Be a good lender. Well, look what the banks are doing. Today, you can see on the screen what the banks are willing to pay you when you lend them your money. 0.15%, 0.01%, 0.01%. 
Oh, how good Wells Fargo, Chase, and Bank of America are to us, aren't they? Well, here's the problem. If we want to be good stewards, we have to be careful of who we lend to, right? God is giving us that money, and we should choose wisely who we lend to. Well, let's look at how this works today. I'm, I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible. If we are lending to the bank at 0.15%, and inflation, which is the chart you see on the right, that's from the, the government, that's an official government Bureau of Labor Statistics chart. Inflation is at 6%. So I'm not even going to dive into what real inflation is. We're just going to use their numbers, okay? Inflation is 6%. We've got a problem here. We are taking our money that God has given us to be a steward over, and we're lending it to the banks for 0.15%. The government is printing money and spending money through inflation. Inflation is taxation without representation. So by using the dollar, we are saving in the dollar. That's our choice as a steward. And the government is now printing to the tune of 6% year over year. That means when you lend to the bank at 0.15% and the government prints at 6%, you're losing 5.85% per year. Okay, now this is an interesting concept because one of the guys turned five talents into 10 talents. One of the guys turned two talents into four talents. The other guy, he just kept the one talent. He didn't lose anything. So the question in my heart becomes, what if I'm losing something? Maybe it's better just to put my cash under the bed and not lose anything, right? I, would you rather bury it in the ground? Well, no, we don't want to do that either because we don't want to be a wicked servant. We want, to, we want the Lord just, all of our goals is to get to heaven and just hear one thing. Well done, my good and faithful servant. That's all we want to hear. And while we're here, we need to make sure we're doing the right things in order for the Lord to say that to us. And money is just one of those aspects, right? As I prayed this morning, thank God it's not based on what we do. Thank God none of this plays a role in my salvation because I'd be in trouble. Thank God it's the blood of Jesus Christ that I depend on and the cross that I look at. Thank God I don't have to worry about this to qualify. But you know what? Since I know that I'm already qualified, since I know the Lord is blessing me and making me a steward, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to try my hardest to turn those talents into multiples more. I don't want to bury them in the ground, and I don't want to lose any of them. So, how do we fix this problem? How do we go about saying, Lord, I don't want to bury my talent. I don't want to lose any talents. That's embarrassing. I want to perform for you. I want to supply for you so that I can lend to my brother, so that I can be a blessing. Matter of fact, Pastor always says this, Re read, keep reading, keep reading. If you read after in, in Matthew, uh, from where we were in Matthew 25, he says, I will say to my people, you clothed me when I had no clothes. You fed me when I had no food. And the righteous will say, Lord, when did we do this? Because as you've done to your brother, you've done unto me. So we want to put ourselves in that position. So we're looking for a solution. Because the world's not going to give us a solution. Okay, let's, let's make that clear. The world will not provide a solution for this. Because they are extracting value from us. They're borrowing from us, the people, for very, very cheap. And then they're going out and diluting the money and not paying us what we deserve for our savings. Right? We're doing what's right. God says be a saver and be a lender. Well, we're saving. But we're just not lending to the right people. We're lending to the world when we should be lending to our fellow brothers and sisters. So how do we solve this problem? Well, number one, we need money that the borrower cannot dilute or inflate. That means you just can't create money based on typing buttons, right? With the banking crisis going on right now, what was their solution? Well, no problem, we're just gonna print $2 trillion. That way, if some bank who lended your money went and lost it because they were speculating, and now you need your money, well, we don't want them to get in trouble. We, want the, we don't want the truth to be revealed. So we'll just print $2 trillion. No worries. Well, what does that do? That means that your talent that was buried in the ground or your talent that was invested in being lent is being cut in half into 2 trillion different slices, and they're taking those slices away from you. That's not a solution. That's not how honest money would work. So we need to ensure honest weights and measures. Look at this. I had to take a screenshot of this instead of putting the verses because there's, there's over 100 verses. These were just some of the best ones in my opinion. 
right on the screen. Proverbs. A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Right? You're thinking in your head, okay, I'm coming with the trade. I got a little bit of eggs. You got a little bit of fish. Let's put it on the scales, make sure this weighs out. Well, if you take everything off and the scales aren't balanced, who's going to be upset? The people who are trading, right? Because it's an abomination to the Lord when the scales aren't balanced, when the scales aren't right, and you're trying to cheat somebody. The Lord is not a cheat. The Lord is about truth and honesty and just weights and measures. Look at the next Proverbs. Unequal weights and unequal measures are both alike an abomination to the Lord. You shall do no wrong in judgment in measures of length or weight or quantity. He's saying, if someone comes to you and they think they're buying a pound of fish, don't sell them three quarters of a pound of fish and tell them that's a pound. That's lying. That's dishonesty. That's not good balances and measures. A just balance and scales are the Lord's. All the weights in the bag are his work. I love math. Not a lot of people like math, but Jesus created math. Even in the word of God, it's called Gamatria. In the, in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, there's a mathematical code. That's how much God loves math. You can actually break down the word with math and still find deeper understanding. It's not just the words, it's not just between the lines. There's mathematical connections too. So I think God is very interested in the concept of money. I think he is looking down and he's seeing a lot of different things, but money is one of those things that he's seeing. And with knowing that, we have to ask ourselves, oh, work with me here. Okay, maybe not. Uh, we have to ask ourselves, how do we fix this problem? So today, I wanted to introduce the concept of truth money. And a lot of people in this world, me included, are aware of what's called Bitcoin. Okay? And Bitcoin is a bank in the internet. That's all it is. It's an internet bank. And this bank doesn't have the ability to print $2 trillion when they lose it. The money is true. There is only 21 million Bitcoin. There will never be any more. It cannot be inflated. It cannot be defrauded. It's a decentralized social network, which means, let's say we created our own bank, and I say, we have a million dollars in the bank. Donald agrees, Sylvia agrees, Sydney agrees, Diane agrees, we all have a million in the bank. Well, guess what? We have a million in the bank. But what if I turn around and I pocket $100,000, and then I say, no, guys, we only have 900,000 in the bank. Elsa says, no, 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 no. We're supposed to have a million. I have it on the ledger right here. Right? Dennis says, listen, man, you're bad at math because we're at a million, not 900,000. This is how Bitcoin works. There is no one person who's in control of the money. Everybody who participates is in control of the money. And when that happens, there's no way to defraud the system. So Bitcoin is a secure money based on truth. And I think the world is waking up to truth money. Because what do we know that Jesus is? The way and the truth. truth. Can truth be from the devil? No. You sure? No, right? Never. Because Jesus is truth. Bitcoin is truth money. I think it's interesting that we have an opportunity as Christians to take the power from the world that pastor always talks about how we borrow so much money, how the bankers abuse the system. And now the Lord has given us the wisdom and discernment and understanding to use truth money, to take the power away from the bankers, to take their ability from stealing from us who are trying to be responsible savers so that we can lend to others and to reward us by not allowing them to steal portions of our talents that he has granted stewardship of us over. So that's it. That's my message today. I didn't want to go too in-depth. Pastor told me, CJ, we, know, we all know you can talk, so keep it to 15 minutes, okay? But today, money is kind of a sour subject in the church. But I am watching the Lord introduce a whole new system 
based on truth. And what I know of Jesus is, because he is the truth, it could only be of him. And that's a really powerful concept. And I believe in the near future, when people are afraid to walk into these doors because of what pastor preaches, when people are not going to donate their money because the bank says, that's a terrorist organization. They don't believe that boys can be girls and girls can be boys, so you're not allowed to give money to that. Right? They're going to use money to control us. Jesus Christ told us that one day we would live in a one world government with a one world system where there were ten kingdoms who all pass their power to one person in charge, and that person has the power to control people based on whether they have a mark in their right hand or their forehead. And if they don't have that mark, they can't buy or sell. How insane is that concept? That was 2,000 years ago that they, that, that's when gold and silver, at least you had gold and silver, you weren't using fake paper money. They have real gold and silver and they're thinking in their head, this doesn't make any sense at all. How can somebody keep me from trading with somebody else? I can do whatever I want. Well, not today. Because today the money is digital. Today all it takes is the government to say, put this tattoo on your hand or put this chip in your hand or your forehead. And if you don't, you can't go to the store and buy stuff. And then once you're in the system, well, you can't donate the church. And you can't do this. And, and oh, you know what? Too many people are buying toilet paper right now, so you can't buy toilet paper. Oh, here's your social security money, but it expires in 15 days. This is what they're trying to do. They want to control us with money because it's not truth money. It's world money. And we as Christians need to just take a step back and say, wait a second. We don't want to use the world's money. We don't want to bury our talent. We want to take our talent and we want to multiply it. We don't want the world to be laughing at us. We want the Lord to be looking down and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And I believe Bitcoin is the first step for the church to separate its economy from the worldly economy in preparation for tribulation and what comes after that. All right, that's it. Thank you, guys.
on a whatever you want to call it, podcast or whatever it is, and a picture of it, and then name is William Booth. You know who William Booth is? The start the founder of the Salvation Army, and he was born in 1829, and he died in 1912. My grandparents moved to Florida in 1911, so I can remember it that way. But William Booth said, the chief, chief danger of the 20th century will be religion without the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, and heaven without hell, William Booth. Now this has been over a hundred years ago when he said it because he died in, in uh, 1912. So I don't know exactly when he said that. What do we have today? Look at our churches. And by the way, he was an old time Methodist preacher too. And we see what our Methodist churches are doing today is, is not good. It's awful. I have a friend, two friends that pastor him the uh, uh, Methodist Church where my hunting camp is in Georgia, and they just had to buy out from that. They could not put up with things like that. They paid them off to get uh, to withdraw the church out of the uh, Methodist, United Methodist, or whatever. But <clears throat> my, what I wanted to share a little bit with you today it was in uh, Psalms chapter one. But first thing I'd like to say, and I've seen in those songs that we were singing, it caught my eye, where it said, the, the beasts will praise him and the birds will sing. Well, when you look at the book of Job, uh, Job chapter 12, starting in verse seven, the Lord said, ask the beast and they shall teach thee, ask the birds and they shall tell thee, ask the fish and it shall teach thee, and it goes on to say in verse 10, for the Lord holds the soul and the spirit of every beast and the breath of life in his hand. I have a friend, I was telling him about the beast. He said, let me tell you a little story about the beast. He said that when the hurricane of 1926 and 1927 in Okeechobee, Florida, the Indians came to town, they said, you guys need to get out of here, this place is going to flood. Well, how do you know? They said, we've been observing the uh, ants, or the ants have been, been climbing to the top of the trees. Have you ever heard that expression? Where did you hear that? A little bird told me. You know where that come from? They come out of the Bible, that's right. In the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 20, be careful what you say of dignity and people in power for the little bird will go and tell them. They come directly out of the scriptures. I thank the Lord for that. And I'm going to be speaking about this word. I've seen in one of the songs. I don't remember everything about it. They're talking about the rocks and the reels. You know what a reel is? R-I-L-L. -L. Did anybody know? It was in this song, the second song. No, it wasn't the second song either. It was in the patriotic song. A reel is a little small stream, irrigation ditch, and we're going, I'm going to be talking about that scripture a little bit in Psalms chapter 1 and starting in verse 1. And the scripture said, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the uh, scornful, for his delight shall be in the law of the Lord, and in his law do he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. And I'm going to stop right there for right now on that. When we look at the man and the, the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Now, which way are we walking today? I would say we're after walking a lot of us in the way of the sinners or the way that our country and our people are doing, the way children are doing, the way 
uh, everything that man's doing. This is true what Romans chapter 1 says, when a man keeps denying the power of God, the word of God, when the God is calling him to come to him, that he'll get him up to a reprobate mind. And it says that's why a man and a woman will lead the natural use of, a, uh, of the body and desire and burn within your heart for the same sex. And then don't stop there when a man continuously denying the power of God and call of God. He's going to give him up to be completely crazy. Just like the demoniac over in, in across the sea of Galilee. But God can deliver them if they can humble themselves. You know, in 1 Peter chapter 5, starting in verse 6, it says, Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and in due season he shall lift thee up, casting all your cares upon him, because he is a God that cares for you. But be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. We need to learn to start walking in the direction of the Lord, the way he's doing, and walking with him. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, it talks about uh, a man that needs to teach his children the way of the Lord when he's sitting down, when he's laying down, when he's getting up, teach them the way of the Lord. And I'm, I'm guilty too. I haven't taught my family the way I need to too. But I am trying and trying to come closer to the Lord. If you're walking with God, just like Enoch, one day Enoch and the Lord were walking, and I've heard this, and it doesn't say it in Scripture, and uh, <clears throat> Enoch was 365 years old when he was walking with God one day, and the Lord says, Enoch, you know it's closer to my house than your house, so won't you just come on and go with me? So the Lord tucked him. So we need to walk with God. And we need to stand with the children of God. If we're standing with the children of God in a congregation in one mind and one accord like it was on the day of Pentecost, there's no telling them what could happen to this country. Not only this country, but the whole world itself. I know the scripture says, for the whole world lies in wickedness. But, but <clears throat> but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So we don't need to be walking with the way of the sinner. We don't need to be standing around in the way of sinner. We don't need to be sitting on the, around the table with the scornful, the one that hate God, that don't love God, and want to kill us and destroy us and put us in jail and put us in prison. When now, when you look at the, uh, the, the word, and Peter is planted by the rivers and the water. Does anybody know what that word planted means in the Hebrew? I love studying stuff like that because I was a landscaper when, it's, when I read it. And, and the Lord will plant it. And I said, I'm interested in that, Lord. I want to find out what that word planted means. Well, I, uh, about 35, 40, 45 years ago, I was on a big project landscaping, <coughs> transplanting some trees, and I took some undesirable trees, and I dug them up, and I transplanted them out there by the roadside. And those trees, it was so undesirable because they were being shaded out from the other trees. But I put those trees out there in sunlight where they could grow and get the nourishment that they needed. They didn't have competition from other plants and trees that was kill actually killing them. So when you see yourself as a tree planted and growing in a real shady area, you know you're going to be destroyed. And that word planted and the Hebrew actually means transplanted, so you take out of that shady area which you're going to be covered with vines and put you out there in a nice open place and watered well. That tree was not planted by a river, it was planted by a rill, which means it's, it was a little irrigation uh, ditch where the water ran down gently and was nourished by the nourishment coming down and well 
protected and given a plenty of energy. So we need to walk with God, stand with God, and be planted by the rivers of God's water where he can come and nourishment. And that's what he tells us. He's the bread of life. He's the water of life. In him is life and there is no death. He would nourish us and bring us and make us mighty soldiers like uh, William Booth there. He's known as a general, one of the great generals of God. And that's what he would do for us. He would take us out of the moray clay and set us up on the rock with the rock of Christ Jesus. We are children and heirs with God, and he loves us, and what he's done for William Booth, he'll do for you and I, because I read in Acts 10, 34, that he's no respect of persons. So you, we need to ask ourselves, which way are we going? Who are we? You know, the scripture said, many is called, few is chosen, but he's going to step up to the plate. So we need to have all of those in our life. When God calls us, we need to know that we were chosen. We need to obey Him so we won't be turned over to a reprobate mind and get about God's business and doing God's business. I believe in this church, I don't know when, one day there will be missionaries called out of this church. I believe there will be pastors called out of this church. I believe there will be teachers and administrators and all of God's people will come in one accord and one mind and serve the Lord with mighty powerful works of the Lord. I never forget, you know who part of the Shambach is? I listened to him one time, probably 35 years ago. That scripture is stuck in my mind in 1 Thessalonians 1.5. But we come not in the word only, but we come in the power and the manifestation of God's spirit. And I believe that's what God will do with us from this said. Signs of wonders will follow them that believe, seeing miracles of God. And I did see some miracles up here a few weeks ago up in Georgia, how God done his wonderful work on some people. And there's no telling where that church is going to go, what's going to come out of that church. It may be Billy Gann, it may be R.W. Sandbaugh, it may be a William Booth, I don't know what's going to come out of there, but I know one day. There's things happening in that church that can just see the presence of God. There was a minister up there that didn't do me right one time up there. And the pastor was up there praying for him. He didn't even know I was behind him. When he laid there, his feet were exposed. I laid my hands on that man's feet. I said, God, in Romans 10, 15, and said, how precious are those feet to preach God's word. I said, Lord, set these feet of fire for you and let him not condemn, but also be in the word and see what the word says instead of what man says. Because what he said and done to me was not of God. And I rebuked him for it too. And <clears throat> I stayed there and kept praying for him. But I don't go to that church no more, but I pray for him. For he is a, he is a mighty good preacher but he just needs to get in God's Word. I don't know how much more time I've got, but I want to thank the Lord for showing me Scripture in, in, the, in the Bible in Psalms chapter 1. I didn't really know what I was going to do until last night. But blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way, sinneth, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law do he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the river of the water. And it goes on to say how fruitful he will be, but ungodly will not be that way, because he doesn't have God's blessing on him. You have God's blessing on him because you belong to him. He wants to bless us, he wants to give us, he gives us divine wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. He will give your heart so much joy and happiness and peace. It's just unbelievable to the natural man. Because the natural man cannot receive the things of God. Neither can he know them because they have to be spiritually discerned. And I want to see if I got something else in here that I needed to share with that. But 
I think C.J. was stick, uh, stepping up to the plate too this morning, and, and uh, I'm sorry about that. I'm not used to speaking to one of these here, and um, but I'm very, very thankful for this church and the people here, and I pray right now that in the name of the Lord Jesus that He will send His Holy Ghost Spirit and touch our pastor. Lay his mighty anointed hand upon him, not only on our pastor, but on each and every one here, and myself and my family, too. And there's some other things I wanted to share when I got, got a sidetrack about the, the beast and the bird that Job, that Job is supposed to be the oldest book in the Bible. I want to learn more and more and more about that because he's seen a lot of things happen in the very beginning and how he trusted God in every way. And when you get back to the beast again, I know, I assume some of you know that I lost our, our little dog that we loved to death. We didn't have any children, so we bonded to her. And that dog, most people don't realize it, if you want to be have a good witness and an uh, opening to talk to people, get your little dog. You can start more conversations about the scripture than anything you ever want to do. Tell them about the Lord, but that little dog, I have met numerous people and shared the word of God with them. But when she died, I didn't want no more because I'm so old. And my wife said, no, we don't need them. And then she got to hungering for one. And we found about an old dog that was in the pound. So we went and got her. And I'm gonna tell you the main reason I went and got that dog. She was eight and a half years old. In the book of Luke, I'm sure a lot of you will know this story. Start in Luke 16, starting in verse 19. And there's said, and there was a rich man that fared sumptuously every day. And there was a beggar named Lazarus that they laid at the gate every day. So if they laid Lazarus at the gate, the rich man had to step over Lazarus to get out, and he had to step over him again to get into his house. And he desired the crumbs that which fell off to the rich man's table. And I was talking to a pastor one day, and he said, well, those crumbs really wasn't crumbs. The Jewish people back then, they just eat with their fingers and the meat and things like that. They get greedy, so they took a piece of bread and they wiped their hand on the bread and basically threw it on the floor and the dogs would come and lick it up or eat it up. But anyway, God sent dogs, plural, to lick the poor man's sores. They had sores all over him. So I said, Lord, as foolish as it seems, I haven't read anywhere where that dog was honored for taking care of your servant when a rich man didn't have no care for him and compassion. I haven't read where uh, a pastor, a rabbi, or anybody else had compassion on that old poor man, that beggar that the rich man gave. I said, and you sent dogs to take care of this man. So I would like to honor this old dog for what her forefathers had done for Lazarus. And you might say, well, that's crazy, but it's not crazy to me. I would like to, to honor Daisy May, I call her, for what her forefathers had done in the past. And I believe God will bless that little baby girl so I can win more people to the Lord and teach more people about the scripture. I just believe that and I know he will because she's such a loving dog and you can learn a lot from an animal. That's what Job says, Job chapter 12, verse 7. Ask the beast and they shall teach thee. You can learn a lot from them when people will not step up to the plate and do what God wants them to do. 
So I thank you for your time, and I thank you for the opportunity to share just a few words about God's wonderful work. And I am so overwhelmed that it is not me, but God does it for me because I have a desire. You know, he said, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. So I thank God for everything he has done for me and uses me to help other people. You know, last week, Pastor was talking in John, well, he that says he loves his brother and don't have no compassion or help for him, the love of God does not dwell in him. So this, this week I've seen these, uh, this landscape crew out there, they had four of them. They had some palm trees on the truck. And these palm trees are heavy. 1,000, 12, 1,500 pounds. And you know what they were doing? They were trying to unload them things by hand and get them off the truck and try to plant them. I said, guys, does any of y'all speak English? And they said, yeah, I do. Here's the foreman. I said, wait a minute. Give me about five minutes. I'll walk there to the house. I'll get my machine. I'll come down and I'll pick those trees up for you and help you plant them. And they couldn't believe it. And, but that's what God wants us to do. Help where you see. If you see your brother in need and you don't help, it's not good in God's eye. He said, if you say you love the brother, I doubt the love of God will dwell within you. Anyway, at the end, he took out $100 and tried to give me $100. I said, no, I'm not going to take it. I said, do you go to church? He said, yes, we go to church. I said, put it, give it to your church to help somebody in need. And another one of the helpers come up to me and he tried to give me $40. I said, no, give it to somebody in your church. And that's what we're supposed to do. And CJ, we just read some of that stuff. You can't keep it all for yourself. Help where you can help. You never know. And that's what the scripture, cast the bread upon the water and do see him, it'll come back to you. So I thank the Lord. It's came back to me numerous times, numerous times. You can never outdo the Lord. And I thank the uh, Lord again for the opportunity to just share a few words of this truth. And that's what his word is, his truth. In Matthew 5, it says, Heaven, think not when I've come to destroy the law of the prophet. I haven't come to destroy, but I've come to fulfill. Heaven and earth shall pass away before one not or tittle on my word be taken out. So I may the Lord Jesus bless you today. Remember I'm pastor and pray for him. And I don't know, I don't hear a lot of things. Did, any, did we say something about the special offering that pastor wanted to get for the people in need in Mississippi. Yeah. Well, we're well, supposed to have to say something about bringing a special offer to help those in need, even though we don't know them, but the Lord Jesus knows them. And, it's, and also said, for the goodness of God also brings forth repentance. So if you can help today, please help. If you can't do it today, now you can help next week. And so, and I thank you again, and let the blessings of God bring you in your heart. So you will. And, and the heart is laid, and the grief is caught, and there's a great story behind that. Maybe we will get into that one of these days. I know one day God can take an old stony heart, hard heart, and give them a transplant, and the Holy Ghost comes in them and transforms them them and to a wonderful, powerful minister of God, just like he did for Brother Paul. So thank you. And Amen. Donald, so thank you. You got the next part. Uh, does anybody have any questions on that uh, about the Psalms 1? I know we didn't cover everything, but I'll give you enough to chew on if you'll think about it. Thank you yourself in transplanting from the evil works of this world, from beer joints to stealing to murder, whatever we were. And he takes and picks us up out of that area that's going to destroy us and transplants us <coughs> that little river. 
not live real and makes mighty soldiers for him. And he will give you a new heart. Thank you. What does the cross mean to me? You know, I was looking back through the hymnal, and over the years, in the 16th century, the 17th century, the 18th century, there's so much has been said about the cross. Some writers have penned their songs based on the cross. One songwriter says, Up Calvary's mountain, one dreadful morn. Walk Christ my Savior, wounded and worn, facing for sinners, death and the cross, that he might save them from endless loss. The cross, you know, you know what makes the difference with the Christian faith? The cross. The cross. You know, I've seen what they depict the crucifixion on the screen. But it cannot be compared to what Christ has gone through on behalf of us. The suffering of the cross, what he endured. So I'm, I'm so glad this morning that Christ paid the price. Amen. One writer also said, it's an emblem of suffering and shame. The cross. Can you imagine? He staggered under the cross. was the weight of my sin that caused him to struggle. Struggling at the cross. Even though it was God who becomes a man to take my sin yes, and nail it to the cross. That's what Paul says the Ephesians. He nailed it to the cross. Because of the cross this morning we are here. We acknowledge him as our Savior and recognize that he has paid the price. Suffer for you and I. One writer said, The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go that the way of the cross leads home. Another writer said, Jesus keeping near the cross, there is a precious fountain. Free to all a helix tree flows from Calvary's mountain. That cross 
if you look at the churches today, the evangelical church, the Baptist church, you will see a cross. And the top of this church, and the last pinnacle is a cross. You know how strange it is that during the course of Aeon, that cross remains steadfast? It's up there, it remains steadfast. The cross, because it represents Christ's suffering. He's suffering for you and I. And this morning we are happy and free because of what is accomplished at the cross of Calvary. I'm not going to take any more of our time. I just want to encourage you to remain faithful. Remain faithful. You know, we are in the final days. As, you look, as we look all around us, begin to see what's happening in the world. We see wars and rumors of war. We see distrust of natural perplexity. We see the hearts of men failing up for fear. And look at the things that are coming up on the face of the earth. My sister, my brother, let us remain steadfast and be faithful because he's coming soon. Yes, he is. He is coming soon. Yes. And our song said, Kneel at the cross, Jesus will meet you there. You know, the greatest meeting place in the face of the earth is at the foot of the cross. The songwriter said, Though millions have come, there's still room for one. There's room at the cross for me and for you. And thank God we didn't kneel at the cross. I can tell you, <laughs> that Sunday morning in 1964, I kneel at the cross. Not figuratively, but I kneel at the cross. Spiritually, I kneel at the cross. And I knew what take place that Sunday morning. It was a glorious Sunday morning, and it still is. And I'm thankful to God for the cross, the old rugged cross. Yes. To my sisters and my brothers, let us be faithful because he's coming soon. Amen. 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 That's my short, short, short thought to you all. God bless you.